All right, welcome back to another edition of the Forts Athletics Life and Coaching Podcast. I'm your host, Charles Inferna, and I have such an awesome guest today that's taken some time out of her busy schedule uh, from, from training and things, Michaela Hazelwood. Thank you so much for taking the time to join the podcast. Thanks for inviting me. Wow, this is so cool. I don't, you know, I, I, I kind of fan out sometimes, I got to be honest, like talking <laughs> talking to uh to athletes who who compete at the trials and are you know perennial um you know elite level throwers it's so cool to kind of you know pick the brain sometimes because i think uh a lot others might be more interested like we were just talking about before of um you know the the lifting and the throwing which is really important um but sometimes kind of like you know like when you get to the in the heat of the moment of trials and national championships Sometimes it's between the ears is what, you know, might separate, you know, the top two, three, four individuals. So um, I th- appreciate you taking the time to join us tonight. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. So when was the first time you picked up a discus? Do you remember? Yeah, so I started throwing in the sixth grade. Mm-hmm. Um, I initially wanted to be a long jumper, mm-hmm. but I had just got out of pneumonia or got out of the hospital with pneumonia like two weeks before track season started. Mm-hmm. And I was a kid that tried out for every sport. So mm-hmm. naturally it didn't matter that I was just in the hospital. I tried out for track and field. Sure. Uh, and I couldn't run down the runway without like not being able to breathe. So my mm-hmm. best friend said, Hey, my brother's a thrower. I wanted to try throwing anyway, come with me. Mm-hmm. I picked it up and never left. Well, so you've been throwing for, uh, like maybe like 15 16 years almost yeah i think this is year 15 year 15 for the for the discus so when you first picked up the discus in middle school there like were i don't want to say were you good but like <laughs> how, how did you take to throwing the discus uh way back when uh, my first meet i threw i think like 44 feet because sure. my senior year of high school my goal was to break my first meet throw in the mm-hmm. discus with a shot put wow uh, <laughs> So not necessarily great by any means. I think I threw like 93 feet um, in middle school. Um, We didn't start spinning in the discus until I was in eighth grade. So I think I threw like 80 feet out of a stand. Our school record was like 88 feet. So I was like, oh, to get that extra little oomph, I guess I got to start spinning. (laughs) Sure. So when did you, um, when did you realize like in high school that you might be pretty good at this? Like, was there a a meet or like a performance where you're like, well, like I could get someone to pay for my college if I throw a discus far enough? Uh, I think I was a little naive. Um, So in middle school, when I first started throwing, I was definitely like, oh, well, I'm beating everyone where I'm from. Um, I'm going to go to school. I'm going to do this. Like, I'm not just going to finish in high school. Like I want to do this at the next level. Mm -hmm. Um, so I kind of had that idea before I was really good enough to go to the next level. Mm -hmm. Um, but I reached out, I lived about 40 minutes from Bloomington, um, Indiana. So there's a track club there called Indiana track club. A lot of the college kids at IU were coaching. So I took it upon myself to go. And my parents were obviously nice enough to drive me because I didn't have a license at the point, at yeah. that point, um, an hour back and forth to uh, practice and kind of get to that next level. So I think I had the idea before I had the skill set. Well, that's pretty cool. I mean, that the, you already had a little bit of foresight into thinking like, wow, like I, I'm going to go to camps, I'm going to go to clinics and, and learn a little bit more about this. When was it in high school that um, there, a, a college coach like first reached out and said, Hey, you know, if you, you know, throw 140, you, you know, we could give you a scholarship or if you throw 150, we could do this. Like, do you remember that first conversation? Uh, not really. I remember like my sophomore year. Um, I think it's like 132 or 133 feet. I started filling out like the questionnaires for schools mm-hmm. um, and just hoping, you know, that things would get better um, and mm-hmm. that people would, start reaching back out to me. Um, Mm -hmm. And then I started getting letters from a couple schools back um, in my junior year. Mm -hmm. And then obviously my junior year is where I threw my high school PR. So Mm -hmm. uh, 
that summer is when I guess I started hearing from coaches, not a lot of division one coaches, but uh, I was the kid that I knew I wanted to be the small fish in a big pond. Well, usually it's the other way around. I, I want to be the big fish in the small pond. What was it about that like mentality that, I mean, it's, it sounds like it started early on, um, like of, of wanting to like, I don't want to say like persevere, but kind of like grit through that. Was there something in particular that like happened in your life before that, that you were like, you know what, I'm just going to, I'm going to make this happen however I can. Not really. I'm just a super competitive person. So mm -hmm. in my head, if I wasn't at the highest level, um, in the higher performing conferences, then if I won, I wasn't really winning. Mm -hmm. Um, not that I think that's necessarily true looking back on it, but in my head, like, oh, there's a more competitive conference. So if I would have won my conference, I wouldn't have won that conference. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to put myself in the position that like, if I won, I felt like I was truly winning um, and I couldn't compare it to anyone else and say, well, I'm good for this. I didn't want to be there. So what uh, ultimately led you to becoming a Boilermaker? Uh, I mean, it was closer to home. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't, I don't know. Coach McBride and I clicked from the beginning. I, mm -hmm. him calling and talking to me, um, he came and watched, I think my junior year at, uh, sectionals, he was recruiting someone else, mm -hmm. saw me, told my high school coach, like, Hey, I see something in her. She's going to be good. Um, and at the time I was like, I'm not going to Purdue. Like it's not happening. <laughs> Um, but after talking to him, I mean, we kind of grew up similar backgrounds, you know, both he's from Indiana as well, you know, smaller area, you know, a lot of lower income families and stuff like that. So I think we just clicked from the beginning. Um, and I just knew it felt right. Um, Purdue felt like home when I went on campus. Um, my now husband and I actually went on a college visit elsewhere and that's how we met um and while we were there we both already went on our visits to Purdue mm -hmm. and it, we talked each other into it we were like everything is perfect there for us <laughs> so when you uh when you get to Purdue what like what were you expecting versus like what was your what was the reality like you're a freshman you're on campus big time high school thrower now you're the small fish in the big 10 what was that like um I mean I expected, I guess, you know, that my first year I was really going to struggle with being like at the bottom, which I mean, I wasn't at the top by any means my freshman year, but uh, by the time conference came around, it was like, oh, I have a opportunity to score. Um, and, you know, I qualified for regionals and all of that. Um, and I, like I said, I'm the competitor, so I'm going to go for it or not. And I pretty much fouled out my freshman year conference because I was like, I'm going to score. Um, and if I don't go hard, I'm not going to score. So um, definitely the Big Ten is a lot more um, academic heavy, too. So uh, the academics part and I think balancing academics and athletics uh, was a little more difficult than I thought it was going to be. But in some aspects, it felt easier because I was doing my schoolwork and I was doing track. Um, in high school, I was in, I don't know, 10 plus clubs, plus sure. I was the mascot and played yeah. softball and did track. So I was in a lot more. <laughs> so when, um, so your personal best in high school, you said you said it your junior year, how far did you throw the discus? Uh, 153.11. And how about your freshman year at Purdue? uh i threw 50 95 so i think that's like 167 167 sure so you put like 25 feet almost in one season like what do you like maybe besides like lifting like what do you attribute that to i mean that's huge yeah i mean like i said i drove to get coached in high school my high school coach was not a throws coach by any means mm -hmm. didn't have like that background and we had one track coach for both men and women's teams, all event groups. So yeah. <laughs> he was pulled many different ways. So I think sure. just the consistent coaching um, and some of my really bad technical flaws um, were worked out 
mm -hmm. um, that year that kind of smoothed it out. Mm -hmm. I think I didn't even have a meet under what I threw in high school on um, my freshman year of college, which is not necessarily typical. <laughs> but you weren't just a, a good discus thrower. I mean, you threw the hammer really well and you're a really good shot putter too. So what did you like, as you're competing your freshman year, were there ever like conversations between you and coach with about, you know, this, you know, discus will be my A event this week and maybe hammer will put on the back burner and then shot. If it goes well, it goes well. Like, do you, did you have conversations like that when you first got to Purdue? Yeah. My freshman year, we actually trained like I was a hammer thrower more than okay. a discus thrower. Mm -hmm. Um, he thought in long run that I would be a better hammer thrower. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't quite figure out very key points of the hammer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like, you know, when you're supposed to accelerate it, uh, yeah. which is fine. <laughs> mm -hmm. But after I made nationals, um, mm -hmm. kind of by chance, but I'll still take that experience. It definitely pushed me to the next level. Um, my freshman year in the discus, mm -hmm. then it, at that point, it was like, okay, well, discus is, yeah, our main event. Um, Hammer's our second event. Shot put my freshman year was a disaster learning the spin. <laughs> and many times did I ask coach if I could be done with the shot put. And he's like, no, yep. you're going to be good. You just have to stick to it. Sure. Yeah, because there were a couple of years while you were um, at Purdue. I think your sophomore, junior, you threw, you qualified for, for regionals in the hammer and discus, right? Yeah, I qualified all four years in both the okay. hammer and the disc. Okay. Um, and then shot put my senior year. I think I finally figured it out enough outdoors my last year. Mm -hmm. shot. So what, is there anything that you, that you take into training today that um, you, you take it or attribute to your time at Purdue? Like, is there anything like your fall conditioning or, you know, you know, cues or things that you, you and your coach talked about that are like, Oh, you know what? Like, you know, five, 10 years later, I still, you know, I'm going to incorporate those into my training. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of aspects I suppose that are the same just because coach McBride has been my coach the whole time. Mm -hmm. um, but something that I think is unique to me is with the discus, my entire fall, um, my freshman year, mm -hmm. I didn't throw a discus. I threw the like Jurgen training tool with like the ball at the handle yep. yeah um because i had such bad orbit and i dove so hard into the center of the ring mm -hmm. um and even to this day if i have a couple of bad practices in a row it's like if i put that in my hand have a practice with that i'm back on track mm -hmm. um and just having that as like a tool to be like okay i've been struggling like i need to have better connection i'm gonna throw that tool mm -hmm. um and i think things like that are important like having those tricks to the trade to where you know it can kind of reset you or walk away for a couple sure. minutes and reset it practice to come back so like so so mentally then like that whole reset piece like i i coach a d3 kids who um you know not necessarily recruited for the most part like i, I coach at a college is more of a technical school so they're going to come to be welders or mechanics or machine shop things like that and if they threw the discus or shot in high school, hey, great. Like, you know, welcome, welcome to the team. How do you like get through some of those training sessions? Cause I, I love like your transparency on social media about like your, your mindset minute things and how like you approach a training session as a professional thrower. Like how, if, how do you, like, how do you get through that now versus like when you were in college, like if you had a couple of bad throws was like, the wheels fall off for that session or how are we able to get back yeah, on track? I mean, from, at, well, yeah. If we think back to when I first started college, I couldn't even like, if my discus practice was bad, my shot put practice was going to be bad right after because I couldn't get out of that mindset. Mm -hmm. um, and then kind of as I've matured as an athlete, I got to the point then like, okay, discus was bad, but both of them can't be bad on the same day. Like, Right. This is the perks of being a three event athlete. Like if I'm competing three events at a meet, one's probably going to go bad. One's going to go great. One's going to be an okay meet. Like if I get something better than that, then it's an amazing meet for me. Mm -hmm. um, and just part of it is I think for the longest time, I thought you had to go like you couldn't take a break and practice like 
if you were fifth in line at practice, mm -hmm. like you couldn't step away and like mess up the order mm -hmm. or, you know, um, if someone else was having a good day and you're having a bad day, like sometimes you felt even worse. Mm -hmm. um, now it's kind of like the more honest you are with your coach, like, hey, I've noticed something's off. Like, is it a technical thing or do I need to take a step back and like reset my mind? Um, am I off? And even at the end of, I remember there was uh, times my weight throw was, I could throw really far, but mm -hmm. could I keep it in the ring? <laughs> eh, not really. <laughs> Did I foul out of more meets than I had marks in? Eh, yeah. <laughs> but there are practices that I would go, hey, I'll be back in five minutes. And I would literally go into the bathroom and look at the mirror and be like, I'm a division one athlete. I'm capable of doing this. Mm -hmm. um, and come back and my practice would be fine again. Like it would, I'd be back on track. Mm -hmm. So um, I think I've put on social media a couple of times too. Like it's okay to like take a step back. Um, my warm ups for any practice or a meet is as much of a mental warm up for me as it is physical. So mm -hmm. it's where I like reset and ground myself to where I am. Um, or I met with sports psychologists weekly in college too. So I mean, there's tricks to that too. I think I've talked about it where I, it's weird, but I lick the roof of my mouth before I throw anything. Cause like, mm -hmm. that's like, okay, that is a sensation. That is where I am. Um, I competed the one year with a torn labrum. So when I was in pain, that was a really big thing for me that I, it's just carried over mm -hmm. um, to be like, you know, the pain's there, but I'm okay. It's not going to hurt me worse, even though I'm, you know, in pain right now. So I think, you know, the stigma with seeing a sports psychologist or any mental health professional by any means is there. And I think that we as athletes with, you know, a big following or, you know, at the elite level need to be open about what resources we've used to help us as well. I mean, it, it, like at the, the D3 level, I mean, we don't really, I mean, there's opportunities to talk to people like our college, we, um, we consult with, um, a team out of Connecticut, I think, but they're not like physically on campus and we don't have like even a psychology department like you. So we're really limited sometimes with what, um, with what's available. But when, like I was in college, I'm much older than you. I graduated in 04. Like there wasn't, I mean, well, one, there was, social media didn't really exist. Like Facebook right. had just come out. <laughs> And uh, you had to wait, you know, forever to, to see track results online and things. So there wasn't, no one really had, you know, conversations about this stuff. So I, I just want to say thanks for, for sharing, because then it's, it's helpful to show my kids like, hey, you know, she throws the discus 210 and, and it doesn't go well all the time. Like you, right. you can, you'll be okay. Right. Um, but uh, so you started at Purdue though, but behind you there, you have, Kentucky so you you traded the big time for the, the SEC <laughs> yeah no I see I know I just teasing, but uh so you you made the transition to Kentucky because your coach went there right yep so how uh, oh sorry go ahead oh no I was just going to start talking about that kind of transition that's, yeah that's where you want me to go with it mm -hmm. um yep. I originally was supposed to graduate in May of 2018 mm -hmm. but I added a second major so I could or hang around at Purdue another um, year for my fifth year. Um, the way that Purdue does things is you can't finish your, or at least when I was there, I don't know if it's changed. Um, you couldn't finish your one degree. Um, you had to be like working at both of them until you were completing to graduate. Um, so I didn't have my first degree finished in May of 2018. I had a little bit of both of them left. <laughs> sure. um, and so in July, um, Coach Green, the head coach that was at Purdue when I was there, um, gave me a call. I was actually on vacation um, and was like, hey, I just, I wanted to call and talk to you personally. I took a job at Kentucky. Um, I know you only have, you know, that last indoor eligibility left. And I know that that's going to be very frustrating for you and what this might cause um as you're training but just know that like if there's anything you ever need from me like help um feel free to reach out like I'm always here for you you'll always be one of my babies uh and 
genuinely, he would help anyone that's been through or been with him that he knows, or even probably a lot of people he doesn't know. Um, that's just who he is. But uh, so I immediately, after I talked to Coach Green, called mm -hmm. Coach McBride and said, okay, um, I know that you don't really know at this point because you probably knew this very shortly before I did. Sure. Um, but what are the odds you go to Kentucky um, with Coach Green? Do you think he's going to offer that to you? Um, do you think that you'll stay at Purdue or that you think that you have the opportunity to stay? And obviously you never know when a new head coach comes in. Mm -hmm. um, and he said, well, I, at this point, and I'm open to whatever's going to happen. I have no idea, you know, if I end up at Kentucky, but you know, there are a high chance if someone else comes in as a head coach here at Purdue, I'm going to have to go somewhere else anyway. Mm -hmm. And I said, all right, well, I'm going to go get off the phone now because I'm going to call my academic advisor and see if I can graduate in December. Um, and that's what I did. I called her. Um, at first, she was kind of like, you have, you know, 21 credit hours you have to finish. How are you going to try and get this done in a semester? I said, if I have to take 21 credit hours in the semester, I'm going to. Mm -hmm. Um, because like I said, coach McBride and I have just clicked on a level that is going to be hard to find ever with another coach. Um, and I wanted to stay with him. He's believed in me from the beginning when a lot of coaches didn't. Um, and I had seen so much improvement and we had seen things that no one had seen yet, um, in a meet before. So it was one of those, I want to stay with him, uh, Purdue, I went and told um, when Coach Elliott ended up taking the head coach role. So he's one of our coaches while I was there too. Um, I went and I was honest with him. I said, I'm going to graduate in December. Um, I don't know that I'm going to use this eligibility that I have left. I honestly, at the time, didn't want to. I was like, I'm just going to focus on discus at this point. I don't have to worry about the other events. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, he was glad that I was up front with him and then obviously because I was still an athlete on campus even though but I wasn't on the team anymore mm -hmm. um they were like well it's a liability for you to use our facilities so I practiced for COVID little did mm -hmm. I know and uh, <laughs> found a <laughs> ring that didn't have a fence around it and yeah. uh practiced at a middle school for six months mm -hmm. on my own mm -hmm. and then of course went to Kentucky in January mm -hmm. So what, so the, the, the training on your own piece, like I, I, I just find that really like interesting, like you're, you're a great college thrower and you're at a middle school. Like, I, I mean, I mean, one is, was there enough space? I mean, you're, yeah, you're I mean, it was, there was enough space. There's like, I don't know, probably 300 feet, but the way it was set up that you were throwing mm -hmm. towards the middle school. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it felt like it was going to hit the middle school when it, it wasn't, but sure. it definitely was a weird um, change. And obviously uh, coach always tried to prepare me to like, if I can't be there, because even at college meets, I mean, you, many people know how it works. There's four throwing mm -hmm. events, the mm -hmm. odds that two of them overlap and you, the coach has to decide which one to be at at that moment. Um, it happens. Right. So he tried to coach us as best to his ability that if we were alone, we could figure things out. Mm -hmm. um, but it was a whole new learning curve uh, when you're completely by yourself and trying to review video and uh, figure it out, the visual to how you're feeling and making sure that that matches up. So, so like when you were training on your own there or even um, at your time at at Purdue was there like did you I mean I'm sure you probably like kept track like this is how many throws I you know I'm gonna take or was there like not like conversations but were there like technical cues that you would focus on for like each session or was that something that you know you and coach kind of tried to figure out as you you know as you went along with the seasons yeah so um there was even a point that coach McBride had all of us for every practice um we had to take an index card and give him what the three things we thought we needed to work on before practice. And he would look over it and then you decide like, all right, like this is what the real root of the cause is. Or like if what you wanted to work on, you thought was 
the problem, but it was actually, you know, what was happening because of the problem earlier in the throw, um, sure. kind of talking through that and saying, okay, this is what we're going to focus on. Um, and then the cues kind of develop um, as you're working through something to where now you're connecting that cue with what you're working through. Um, not always did we do that, but I think that's something that once he started that in my own head, I kind of, before practice, like, hey, looking at video from last practice, this is what we should work on, right? And moving from there. So you, well, literally and figuratively, I guess you, you move from there from Purdue and you go to Kentucky. Was, was there many differences? Like, as far, I mean, SEC and, you know, Big Ten, I mean, the yeah. competition's pretty similar, you think? Yeah, I mean, the competition part? was similar. Mm -hmm. um, it kind of worked out since I ended up competing that last um, indoor. I got my first conference medal, which was weird <laughs> after being in the Big Ten for four years and having, uh, I think, four fourth place finishes mm -hmm. um, to then my first meet in the SEC getting a silver medal. And the Big Ten and the women's shop at that year, when it was when it's took its first big jump and it's kind of held strong since. Um, so it was one of those. I got the conference medal and back to what I was talking about earlier, I was like, well, this would have been fifth in the big 10. So, sure. <laughs> right. Uh, but obviously I was happy to finally get a conference medal mm -hmm. and kind of break that barrier. It made it worth coming mm -hmm. back and competing on indoor. So when you, when you graduate or when you, I guess when your time is done at Kentucky, like when did you first realize like, hmm, like 2020 is around the corner, like COVID hadn't happened yet. Like, did you know that you were going to kind of postpone life for a couple of years and, and try for the trials or how, like, who do you talk to about that? Um, yeah. So my sophomore year of college, uh -huh. when I threw 55 with a torn labrum was when I was like, if I can throw this injured, uh -huh. I think that, you know, maybe I should train through 2020. Then it was like, well, let's see how the surgery goes and how I come back. Mm -hmm. Then after not training for the entire fall and still PRing um, my junior year, I talked with coach and we had already committed to training through mm -hmm. um, the Tokyo trials and trying to make the team. Mm -hmm. um, then things got complicated um, and right. he went to Kentucky and I followed and then I had committed to training with him through 2020. So mm -hmm. And then my husband, because he's he was at Ohio State um, in his PhD program mm -hmm. when all of this happened, um, it was kind of like, if you're going down to Kentucky and committing to living down there for two years, you're going to get a master's degree. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of where all of that played into. And it, through 2020, it was when my master's would end up, I'd have the whole summer. Mm -hmm. um, and then I would make the next decision. Um, COVID happened. So that made things a little more difficult. Um, and things got kind of crazy because I had already trained through 2020. There's no way I was going to give up and not go the extra year. Um, so all the last year, coach was actually coaching me virtually because I was up here in Columbus um, and he was down in Lexington. So it was a whole nother element that we hadn't done before. <laughs> What's uh, out of curiosity, would you uh, earn your master's degree in? Uh, health administration. Health administration. So is that, um, is that how you like moonlight during the day? Like you, you have a full-time job, right? Yeah. So yeah. I work full-time as a quality supervisor at a, a mental health facility here in mm -hmm. Columbus. So they've been so flexible and so helpful um, in making sure that if I have a meet, even if it's, you know, I was gone for a week and a half for trials and then came back for a day and said, I'll see you in another week because I have to go chase sure. <laughs> the Olympic standard. Right. They were super uh, flexible and they were aware that obviously if I would have made the team that that would have added extra time off. Sure, you would have been gone like pretty much all of August, right? Yeah, for the most part. So when um, when you start training during COVID and there really aren't like that many meets, like how do you like how do you stay motivated and, and engaged? Maybe motivated is not the right word because, you you know, you're at such an elite level. Like how do, where where does it come from that 
okay, you know what? The trials are, are canceled. I got another year. Like, how, like, how do you do that? Like, how's that work? So for me, I, at that point was a 50 meter discus store. So mm -hmm. I was like, oh, this year is my opportunity to really make sure that I am at the level of everyone else and that I can compete to truly try and make this team. Mm -hmm. um, so I took it kind of as an opportunity um, to get better. Obviously everything was shut down. So the colleges mm -hmm. were shut down. A lot of the high schools were shut down and locked down here. Mm -hmm. um, I got kicked out of a couple of them and during COVID. <laughs> But, you know, you finally find a place that, you know, they're okay with you being there and yeah. is a good enough space for you. And you kind of figured it out. Yeah. Um, video coaching was a whole new element um, and trying to coordinate times. Sending videos did not work. Um, right. The communication just wasn't there. So we did a lot of Facebook messenger video calls and yeah. at least twice a week, we'd touch base and make sure that, um, he had eyes on me at practice. Mm -hmm. So when you, when, you know, we, we get out of COVID last year, kind of, and things kind of go back to normal. Um, when you opened the season, what, like, what, what were like expectations? Just we're going to, I mean, I think you had the Olympic, you had the trials qualifier beforehand, right? Cause I kind of carried yeah. over. So was it just, we're going to grind it out and see what happens or we're going to kind of pick and choose because you didn't compete too much. Right. I mean, you kind of pick and choose where you're going to, um, you know, go, you're going to throw at that level. Right. Or you wouldn't, I don't, well, I mean, you tell me. Yeah. After COVID and there wasn't meets, it mm -hmm. was like, I opened way earlier than I should have. I wasn't ready mm -hmm. to open when I did last year. Um, but it was kind of like, there's a meet, it says that they allow open individuals. I'm going to hop on a plane. Um, <laughs> and go to this meet because I want to make sure that I can at least compete. If everything gets shut down again, I want to make sure I get a meet in. Sure. Um, and we tried to set my, set me up to be fresher at the beginning of the season last year. Um, just knowing that we were kind of chasing a mark, um, mm -hmm. and wanted to try to get something bigger early. So then we could, you know, kind of get some more load on me and then peek back out for trials. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was, not helpful in the sense of getting a good mark early last year, but helpful in realizing um, the way that I had peaked in the past um, with being a three event athlete um, was not going to work the same as a one event athlete. Mm -hmm. And USA's in 2019, I had the same issue. I couldn't feel anything. Mm -hmm. um, and so it wasn't going anywhere. Um, but doing it again at the beginning of the season, realizing that both times it happened, it wasn't a coincidence. That was just my body couldn't peak like that. Um, so it helped me. And obviously I was set up the way I needed to be for trials um, mm -hmm. with the big PR there. So um, sometimes you think you're trying one thing out uh, as a coach and an athlete and you learn <laughs> something else. <laughs> sure. But I mean, but uh, setting the personal best at the trials, I mean, not, not many people like walk into those high pressure situations like that. So how are you kind of able to, to like rise, rise through the qualifying and then, and then come back and, you know, throw well again? Uh, I think there was two components. Um, in college, I had a lot of uh, mental issues when it came to NCAAs, uh -huh. um, just like the pressure, um, especially my senior year. I had this in my head, like our team was really good and we were trying to, you know, trophy at nationals. And I had that expectation of like, I have to do this for them um, and for better or worse, when I think I need to do things for other people, I do worse than if I think I need to do it for me. Mm -hmm. um, and so I had that and kind of learned through that, um, I think, a couple years of, you know, maturity later and being able to reflect on things and how I, the mindset I had, um, I've, I totally reframed how I attacked meets last year. Um, and so that helped. And then secondly, I went into trials, um, kind of at the point that it's like, all right, I've been doing this for a couple years after college, but I haven't made it to that like next level. 
to where you're really like considered, you know, elite um, as kind of in that gray area between a good college <laughs> athlete and an elite discus thrower. So it was like, this meet's going to be my last meet unless I do something. Um, and I tend to thrive when I put that kind of pressure on myself. So. So going into the trials, is that where you were thinking, if I don't, if I don't hit it, I'm going to retire and not throw anymore. Yeah. That was kind of where I was at. Um, it was kind of like, it's not going to be, uh, you know, 60 meters isn't going to make teams. Um, I need to prove to myself that I can truly can, can compete with these people um, because I had been to USA's three times before and not made the final and kind of just been there. Um, so I had to prove I could compete with everyone to really believe in myself to the next step. So here we are. <laughs> so, yeah, here we are. And I'm, and I'm glad that you're still, uh, you're still competing. So you, you threw it the, the trials, you set a personal best and, uh, then you started chasing, right? Like you said, so like, so what, were there a lot, many more opportunities after? Cause I think it was, it's like what June 26th or something you have until, or like whatever yeah, it was. I think it was the 29th. It was whatever right. that Tuesday mm -hmm. was, mm -hmm. um, after I had competed at trials. Mm -hmm. um and I didn't have an agent um so it makes things even more uh complicated because there was a couple of higher ranked meets in terms of world rank because I was also ranked like 37th I think in the world mm -hmm. you had to be in the top 32 or have the standard mm -hmm. so we went through the whole what meets are ranked meets that we can go to mm -hmm. um to go that route or what meets are available and conditions that I could throw far in um, trying to hit the standard. Mm -hmm. um, there was not very many meets, period. Mm -hmm. um, and from the information that we had at the time, um, the Bahamas National Championships was a B-level meet. Mm -hmm. We didn't understand once we booked the flight and everything that if you lived in the Bahamas, just like, so I went, it would, my place, I didn't get a place rank on what I threw there. Um, I didn't throw well anyway, um, but that's beyond the point. It was kind of like we went there because it's a B-level meet, it wasn't. Um, there was a couple of meets in Europe, but you kind of had to have an agent and know how to get around um, in Europe with all of the COVID protocols and I didn't right. have that. Um, and then there was a couple of meets um, randomly in the US and there was a decathlete at Michigan that was trying to chase two. Mm -hmm. And that's how I ended up, I threw two days at Michigan after I had thrown at the Bahamas uh, National Championships mm -hmm. um, because he was like, we're already hosting the meet. You might as well come up. We can host the discus too. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a crazy time trying to book flights and <laughs> figure sure. out plans. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but like does does USATF like in that situation I mean I'm, I'm just guessing I don't know if it's the naivety in me like they wanted you to go right so that when was there like other support of like hey we'll you know fly here or go here or do this or uh, do that no not really um <laughs> they explain I mean they did a very good job of explaining the situation and I mean in their situation they wanted the top three place finishers at trials to go mm -hmm. to the Olympics, but Kelsey, who had gotten fourth, mm -hmm. had met the requirements. So it wasn't um, like they didn't have someone to take um, right. if I didn't. Um, and they were very clear, like, you know, what that meant for me um, and her um, through the whole thing. So, yes, they tried to help me and they tried to explain, like, what I needed to do and you know, were very helpful if I had questions, but in terms of like trying to help me find places, not necessarily. So, so after the meet then, and like I was going to ask before, like, did you, that's why I, wrote, I had to write it down so I don't forget. So did you tell anybody like your husband, like, hey, if, if, if this doesn't go well, like we're going to retire or, or like, or was it just something that you, between you and coach or? I mean, my husband was aware. Um, sure. And I mean, cause we talked about it, I mean, several times. And there was at the beginning of last season when I was throwing like 55 and 56 meters in meets, 
there was a lot of questions I had personally of like, okay, this is feeling good and not going far. And maybe I don't have what it takes. Mm -hmm. um, but like I said, then I realized that, oh, my body has to have a little more load on it when it peaks. It can't mm -hmm. be completely uh, like what most people would determine as fresh mm -hmm. um, and learn from it. And then at the end of the season, you know, was consistently 59, 60 mm -hmm. meter throws. So it's just learning um, those things. And that confidence at the back end of the season is when I knew, knew that I can make it at the next level and hopefully will prove so this year. Mm -hmm. So you have this year. So when I know you've been posting some pretty cool clips, like how, when are you planning on opening up? I mean, I live in uh, Western New York. We, we got like four, four inches this weekend. So Columbus, I can't imagine that uh, there's a lot of nice weather here at the beginning of April. Are you, is there like Arizona or like um, uh, Mount Sac? Like, is that what the plan is? Yeah. I plan on opening at Triton on the 8th mm -hmm. of April. Mm -hmm. So, and then not quite sure from there, um, Kentucky and Ohio State both have home meets, I think the 22nd mm -hmm. of April. Mm -hmm. So if I'm not going anywhere, I'll probably hit up one of those. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jesse Owens Classic. Okay. I've, had, I've had athletes compete there. I love, I love coming to Columbus. It's really fun. So after, so after this year, then you have the world championships. So is it, uh, I don't know, maybe it's too early to ask, like, you know, 20, I mean, after I, you know, cause I have uh, a couple of post collegiate kids that um, were like, Oh, you know, coach, I'm, I'm 28. It's two more years. Like I got to throw the hammer a lot farther. And I'm like, yeah, but you, you're only 28 once, man, like <laughs> two years, you could, you've already sacrificed what's another two years. But uh, like, is that, have you kind of thought about that a little bit or you just take it as, you know, how this season goes, we'll see how, how it goes after the fact. I've very openly talked about training through uh, 2024. Yeah. Um, I, there's the sting that I have mm -hmm. from getting second at trials and not making the team, I think is yeah. going to be there until I uh, make a team. Sure. Um, so I'll be through 2024. Um, obviously just want some good things to put into my confidence bank this year. Mm -hmm. Obviously the main goals being making the world championship team. Um, mm -hmm. And then having a meet average over 60 meters. Mm -hmm. So those are my two big goals. Mm -hmm. So, so with that, then like, how do you, like, if, if there was going to be, you know, a, a college senior this year, I was going to say Michaela, like I threw the discus, I don't know, 55 meters in college, male or female, what, like, should I keep training? Like, what advice do you have for, for that next, like the, the next group of, of throwers, I guess, if, you know, continue on with life and get a job and or or try and do like you and have which it totally boggles my mind you, know, you have a full-time job and you're an elite like discus thrower like how like what would you say to them like would you say you know just do it or eh, get... I mean if you want to do it do it I there's nothing stopping you I mean not only me, like Rachel, I think was a 56 meter discus thrower and now is a 64 meter discus thrower. I mean, mm -hmm. it happens all the time that mm -hmm. some of us underperform in college or just haven't met our potential yet. Mm -hmm. If you feel like you're still getting better and you love the sport and you want to go for it, I think that go for it, especially mm -hmm. if you have a coach that's willing to help with help you, mm -hmm. whether that be the coach you have right now or another coach mm -hmm. outside of you know, your current training circle. I think that you're only young and healthy and fit once. So I, do what you I, can I, while you I, can do it. <laughs> well, I, I ask kind of like tongue in cheek because like, you, you know, if for, for, you know, like you mentioned, like you, maybe you underperform in college, like, how do you like, is it just um, like the, the internal satisfaction of maybe not, I'm, I'm not going to prove others wrong, but you know, maybe I, you know, I didn't all American or I didn't do this or I didn't do that. So I'm going to, you know, guns a blazing once I graduate, like, is it just like a patience thing or. I don't have patience. So, that's no. okay. so, it. so it's not a patience thing. Okay. So we'll strike that one. But like, you know, um, I think, Oh, I do have a chip on my shoulder. Um, mm -hmm. I'll own it. I, there was plenty of college coaches that said that I wasn't going to make it at the division one level. Mm -hmm. So then naturally I, 
proved that I could make nationals all four years um, at the division one level. And so that chip still stands like, oh, they didn't think I could make it at the division one level. I'll show them that I can make it on the world level. Right. Um, and just the constant like, oh, she's too small. She doesn't have long enough lovers. Um, I kind of want to be that like annoying little bug that sneaks her way through <laughs> and proves that like throwers can be in all sizes. I think right. more and more so you see like there's such a variety. Um, at one point in time, they always said you had to be big and tall. I mean, Val is ripped and throwing far and, you know, there's people that are short and throwing far. People, you know, that are all, you know, weights and sizes and everything and I think that's part of the love of the sport like you just it's so technical like figure out the technique that works best for your body and you might throw far and shock the world right well is it so then maybe maybe not a patience for the athlete but do you think maybe at like the college level like for for coaches like I said like I mean I'll take anybody but I'm at a d3 school where there isn't like pressure if we don't do well at conference or anything like that like there's four teams in our outdoor conference like if if my throwers don't do well like for me it's like oh boy like there's you know two teams don't have throwers like <laughs> you should right like you should do well but do you, like is there I don't want to say stigmatism I don't know what it would be um like at the college level especially d1 like for coaches like there's not as much time for them to take a chance on somebody like if I don't know, like New York state, like female discus throwers will go maybe like 160 will win the state championship. But then for most, you don't really hear from them after that. Like, so is, is, do you think that, I don't know, like that coaches maybe should take flyers more often or it is just not, there really isn't the opportunity at like the big 10 or SEC to, you know, take a 110 foot discus thrower from high school and see what happens. I don't know. I mean, one of my good friends in college and teammates, she was like a 120 foot discus thrower um, and like a 40 foot shot putter. Mm -hmm. And she ended up being a 63 meter hammer thrower. So mm -hmm. I think that the marks people throw in high school um, don't necessarily mean a whole lot. I mean, they can certainly, um, but some people have like something about them that you think is going to be the next level. Um, for me, and like I said, Coach McBride was recruiting someone else and then saw me, um, was how explosive I was mm -hmm. and the snap that I have. Um, so that's something that we play into every day, you know, and my technique definitely plays into how explosive I am. Mm -hmm. Whereas the person I was just talking about, she has such long levers. Um, she could get so long with the hammer or the weight and she was the first team All-American in the weight. So, I think that coaches should have open eyes and see, you know, the athletes and take chances. I mean, just because someone doesn't throw far um, in high school, like you can take a chance on someone and bring them in on books or, you know, mm -hmm. even as a walk on and right. they could end up being your best athlete on team. Mm -hmm. Any, any chance of you um, speaking of that, any chance of coming out of retirement and throwing the hammer again? No, I don't think so. <laughs> no. I mean, you were 200 in college. You never know. No. No. Uh, like I said, <laughs> I didn't quite understand important parts of it, um, which I know that now, but I don't think sure. the ground to pick that back up is worth it. I'll stick to the discus. <laughs> right. Well, I, I think, yeah, you, I think you'll be a little bit more successful now, right, in the discus than trying to, trying to come out in the hammer. But uh Michaela, thank you so much for, for taking the time and, and sharing these bits of wisdom and, and insights and things. Um, I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for bringing me on. It was fun. Well, best wishes with uh, World Championships and uh, you know we'll follow along with the 2022 season. We'll see how it goes. Thank you. You're welcome.